morning, everybody. Um, thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, I would like also to thank the convener for letting me present some update on the MARPA project. But before you know, presenting you what's MARPA and what we have been doing, I would like to really thank my uh, co-leader on this project, which is Christine Delon, which is here today, and also the two other ones that could not come, with Halle Kilborn and Van Ren Williams. I would like also to thank all the project members, the long list here, because this project is a community project, and without the input from the community, then, well, it could not be such a project. So what's MARPA? MOPA is the Marine Annually Resolve Proxy Archive Community. So, so far it's encompassed, of course, corals, but also mollusks, fish atholites, coralline algae, sclerosponges, and you know, whoever wants to join that has record that is annually resolved, so at least one data, one information per year. That's kind of the only requirement. <coughs> bit of, um, of uh, how MOPA started, a bit of a story of MOPA. So we started uh, early 2013, actually in February 2013, at one of the first EarthCube workshop on cyber infrastructure for paleogeosciences. <coughs> so the goal of this workshop was technically to identify the critical uh, cyber infrastructure needs and the opportunity that exists currently for geosciences. And after a two days workshop, you know, we came to the consensus that it'd be really good to link all the existing cyber infrastructure. But I raise, and other people raise some concern about, well, some community, such as the MARPA community, did not really have any cyber infrastructure. And by that I mean like, we put our data in some website, but then that's it, then they're not easily, and we can't really integrate them together, it's really not hard, it's hard to extract them, therefore we cannot merge them with anything. So we feel like, we, you know, we need to do something, we need to, you know, to get the community involved to start deciding we need to do something to be able to be part of EarthCube and to be part of merging all the data together if we don't want to be left alone you know, in our own community together. So you know, we started, um, started talking and I'm you know, trying to uh, come up with the MARPA uh, theme and the whole idea was MARPA could be used as a facilitator of communication between you know, our community, the data provider, and also different community of data users. So that's the scheme that uh, the idea that was kind of at the beginning. So we would like, you know, to have some data stored in a way that it could be reusable for people like the community like Pages 2K that assimilate multiple data, but for also other different type of assimilation project. And also, you know, in a way that we use, um, we store them in a way that other communities such as a climate modeler could actually understand what we put there and how they could actually benefit from it. And also for us, because I'm going to disagree with what you said uh, on, on Wednesday, Julian. We actually are not just data provider. We do some data analysis, and we would like to also, you know, use also our data and compare with other type of data. So the I cyber. Don't think you said a need yeah. <laughs> you said a bit that you know we should. <laughs> we were on the left side of your graph, and the data analysis was on the right side. We are upset. <laughs> I didn't say it was. <laughs> what I said is that I don't know a single person who does all four of these things. Well, but there I is, know lots good, of there is some do. people in the room that do. Anyway, they were upset, so I wanted to raise the <laughs> to raise the concern. Um, so for actually for the MOPA infrastructure, there was actually two type of metadata that was needed because we work on on archive, we work on physical sample. And those physical samples have some requirement to, to have some metadata stored. So we have the physical sample and their related and pertaining metadata. And we have also the derived data and what we call the proxy observation um, data that also have metadata linked to it. And the, the idea was like, well, we need to come up with a way of having standardized data management that we could actually link both the physical sample metadata with that derived data in a way that it would be easily retrievable. So we start working and we started with the easiest part, the physical sample. So what was the current stage? And I won't say was because now we made some progress so it's hopefully not really the case. So before, for all the metadata pertaining to physical sample, it was stored on, like all the, even all the sample by themselves, 
were stored on the PIs on basement, on the lab, technically. And all the metadata, all the sample lists were on personal spreadsheets or field notes and things like that and store somewhere on a desk or on a box or on the basement too. Well, I don't think I need to explain what the problem are with this system. Well, no plan for future retrieval. So if we, you know, if we want to get back to those data, well, have fun looking at that. And also for mitigating hazard, that's actually a pretty close story to me because Brad, uh, Brad Lindsay at Lamont has his coral store on his own basement and he got flooded. So thank God he could save that, and we actually saved the coral. He lost some personal item, but he saved the coral, so <laughs> that was actually good. Uh, so yeah, that could not stay like that. So what, so what we need, what we need is the place to archive those, you know, physical samples, but especially the metadata pertaining to those samples. On a way that it's common to everybody, a common template that everybody could use, and an easy way for non-computer savvy people, because if it's hard, then we won't do it. That's pretty much what happened. So we find, we find as MAPA, we find a, a, a solution. We find the CISO, so a system for Earth sample archiving, I think. Uh, it's NSF-funded uh, infrastructure that is held at Lamont. Um, so what it is is that is an Excel template for some of us that love Excel. I know not everybody loves it, but some of us love Excel. It's easy. You just Download your Excel template, get all the information you want to add. As a MOPA community, we came up with some, uh, let's see, standard that we think it needed to be easily retrievable later, such as the sample name, material, field name, and, and so on. And then when we get CSAR, what does CSAR is that he sends directly, it gives you like an IGSN with a unique identifier, which actually gives you, so it's one number, and you can put as much information into that number. So here are all the fields that you entered, and it gives you your, the AGSN, but also a QR code, which is kind of cool because you can just you know, scan it and everything you know, appears, all the information are there. Uh, and some of the stuff that we were not planning on having, but actually came with Caesar and that were pretty cool, it's an offline, online storing, meaning that you could send all your information to Caesar, but say it's private, it's only for me, or you could just share it with some of your colleagues. You're like, okay, I have that person, I like them to share, you know, this data, you just share. And when it's published or whenever you feel like it, you just put it online and everybody could actually access it. IGSN right now has been also um, recommended in publication, like Elsevier start um, asking for them. It's actually wonderful because I'm sure a lot of you, when you have to publish your sample, you have to put all the information in a manuscript, which nobody body care about it, but you have to do it. But instead now you could just put a table with all the IGSN number and if people want to see where the data come from, just click on it, it's linked to CSAR and they could have all the information. You don't have to worry about actually writing everything down. They also give you a yearly summary, so it'd be great for when you have to do your yearly report. You just, they give you well, you know, how much information you put in during the year. And also a thing really cool with CSAR is that you could store as much additional information as you want. So all those pictures, and if you want you know, a picture, you get x-ray, you get whatever you want, you could store it there. There is no limitation of space. And a new thing that I was trying to work on, I'm not sure it's, on, it's available yet or not, but they were working on a small device that you could just bring with you on the field, and then directly on the field, put all the information pertaining to it. When you get internet, you link it, you get your IGSN number, and there is a label printer and then beam on the field, you get your QR code, stuck it to your sample, and then you're done. You get to the lab and everything is already done. You don't have to worry about losing your field note and so on. So, you know, we talk about that on your recently published uh, EOS paper, serving, Saving Our Marine Archive. You get all the information on how we did that. And if you go on our website, mapawordpress.com, you will find YouTube video explaining how to do that from the beginning to registration to CSAR to entering all the information and to having everything done. And I would like to thank uh, Gil, this is a Christine PhD student because he spent a lot of time making all those really cool YouTube videos that are really interesting and really easy to use. And that's the proof of concept that, was, that we did at Lamont. That was all the <laughs> coral that we retrieved from retired PIs. 
and the notebook that I showed you earlier were pertaining to those type of coral, and we had um, Mike Sandstrom, which was Moremo PhD student, that spent a couple months just organizing that, and he went from that mess to every core in a box with QR <coughs> code and BIM, IGSN, and label, and all the information that were there are there. It's kind of cool, easy, and uh, I think it's, it's a cool thing to do. So now, now the hard part, the derived data. So current storage, you know, still before publication, PI's computer, hopefully on some external hard drive too, but maybe not. And after publication is NOAA, Palo Climate, OpenGL, are the two main places where we store physical um, derived data. Well, the problem with this system that there's still not really any standard template to store them, so therefore it's not, well, as you know, Julian, not easy retrievable because everybody uses their own name. And uh, a lot are not publicly available because people don't actually put them neither in Pangea or NOAA. And also some community, as some of you are seeing here, don't have a space neither in NOAA or Pangea. So while well, those data are still in that computer. So what it is needed is the place to properly store them before and after publication, a common template, therefore we all do the same thing, and an easy way uh, to do it and I would say getting credit for it. So it's like, yeah, now it's time, you know, to, we did with physical sample, now it's time to do the same with a geochemical sample. So we started to work with Pangea, with, oh, Pangea, sorry, with Noah, with Kerry and Bridget. They started to redo their Noah website to integrate all the different archives with similar, um, similar vocabulary. So we helped them, and Marpa work with them to create those, um, those standards. And we came up with a template with some information that we feel are needed for our community to have stored. So it's not really easily readable here, but we really base this template on the Pages Ocean 2K template and some other template that were available from Pangea, NOAA, and some other uh, places. And so we just need your opinion on it. We just now need you to just comment on it. We receive already some comment about, you know, some stuff to add or to remove. And to do so, you can do it on the MAPA website under uh, discussion, or you can do it on the Linkers Wiki, uh, as Julian presented uh, Wednesday, and once the tutorial did that, you could actually uh, start also commenting under the MAPA uh, group. So yeah, so the technique is just, you know, join us. We have the MAPA website, we have tweet, so you can tweet us, uh, or email us at MAPA, and you could actually register on the MAPA website to just join the news the mailing list, you just enter your name and your email, and you promise you won't receive too much, just a monthly uh, newsletter. That's the only thing I'm gonna bother you know, to send you uh, every month. And something that we want to do right now is uh, we are thinking on keep going on the physical sample because people have been requesting some best practice to store actually the physical sample. And so, so far we have Janice Liu that offered to show us a video on how she did an amazing <laughs> creation uh, thing at Townsville. So we are you know, looking forward to you know, everybody to just chip in and give information so that uh, we have information on what's the best practice and for young uh, scientists that start working on the coral, they could actually know what to do, what not to do, or what works best. Thanks. This, um, this IGSA number and how that differs from a DOI. And then the other thing is for this physical um, uh, archives. I think this is really important, but um, because we're dealing in materials that might be um, protected under CITES, how do you get materials from, say, one country where they were collected or initially studied to the, the destination archive country, which may be different? This could be very expensive and difficult. Okay, so for the IGSN, how it is different from the DOI? Pretty much the same, it's just a unique identifier, meaning that there's only one, and it's a, a company actually in Germany that create those, and that's similar, I think it's just similar, it's just a, a number. Oh, but I don't think you could get DOI for physical sample. Could you? Because you could? As far as I know, you can get DOI for anything. Okay, well for the, for the IGSN, the only thing is that because it's linked now to CESAR, therefore, you know, if you, if you click on it, it's gonna be linked to all the information. For DOI, if you click on it, you get to a paper, but not sure it's integrable. I don't think a DOI could be, I don't know, I'm not a, 
Probably, yeah. We select that because Caesar we found it was cool and it was fr oh, it's free also. <laughs> Sorry, forgot to mention. And uh, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, it's solid for sediment core. Uh, the um, I don't know how we call it. It's set DB. Set DB also use that. And uh, I mean, if there is other you know solution, we are. We are open to all solutions. We just found that that one was easy and cool, and, uh, and we did. And for the other question, I never been on a field, so I never had the chance or the issue to bring back a coral. But no, I. You have 30 seconds. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I I sorry. <laughs> yeah. To so to bring back, I don't know. I know people have been lying and say it's rocks. That's the only thing I I know people do. <laughs> So I'm not suggesting it, but that's the only thing that I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too cheap from one country to another for the post. Oh, yeah, that should be, uh, could be, you know, you, know, you could go on the MAPA website and that discussion, create your own topic of discussion. Thanks for doing it, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone, for coming to the data stewardship session. Uh, thanks for the chance to, to talk. Um, so I'm going to share a bit about linked paleo data, or lipid as we call it, and as you've probably been seeing this pop up around the meeting here and there, and if you're like most people, you probably have absolutely no idea what it is or what it means or what it's for. So that's um, what I'm gonna try to share with you in the next few minutes. Okay, so, so why lipid? So I, I'm not a computer scientist. I didn't, uh, I didn't wake up one morning and feel super motivated to go uh, make a data standard. The reason that um, the reason that I got into this a half decade ago, maybe a bit more now, um, was because because I wanted to do I wanted to do big science. We want to do big science, and in our field, a lot of times we, that means we want to look at a whole bunch of data from a whole bunch of different kinds of archives, and want to pull it all together and try to see what kind of signal we can distill from the noise, and do projects like this. And if you've ever done a project like this, you've, and, and you've all, if you're in this room, you probably have, because if you haven't, you probably don't care that much about data stewardship. Um, it, it, it feels a lot more like, like this <laughs> than, um, than, than like doing big science. So, so this, is, this is me, circa 2011. <laughs> and still today sometimes. Um, and, and, and more than that, we also want to be able to analyze our data. Maybe we don't want to do a big synthesis, but there's all these great tools that are emerging. And being able to take advantage of that tools is often, um, it's great, the, the, the concepts are out there, but uh, we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel when trying to you know, do some sort of agents or an analysis or using proxy system models. Those tools are out there. We like that to be a little bit more simple. So that's, that's why we did Lipin. So a solution to this problem is, is is, is, is linked paleo data. Um, here's this, this is the, the sort of most appealing way of looking at this. Um, and so you'll see this float around. And the idea is that is a, is a data set, right? This is sort of a, a, a indescript a unit of a data set which has all these pieces to it. We sort of know this fundamentally and it splits it out into, you know, where is this thing and who published it and who paid for it. And then all the meat down here is sort of what does, what the paleo data, which I think of as, as the y-axis, um, of our plots, the, you know, the paleo environmental information and the cron data, which is the, uh, the x-axis, the, uh, the, uh, the paleo temporal information, um, which all have their own data involved in them. And so there's just a few things I wanna, I wanna point out here. Um, so both, and you notice the structure is mirrored. So we have measurements, right? You go and you measure things on your, on your archive, whatever it is, um, you actually measure them. We would like to keep those original raw measurements together. Um, and we also often then also model them, right? So we have some interpretation, we have some sort of derived data. This could be like an age model, this could be like a, a, some sort of um, maybe a Bayesian um, model that's simulating something on the y-axis side. Um, so that, that can go in there. And then inside that paleo model, there's a whole bunch of stuff, but including things like ensemble tables. So if you wanted to do age uncertain analysis, you're in the ensembles, and rather than starting from scratch, right, it'd be great if those were just in the data set and ready for you to use when you want to use them. And then the last thing I want to point out on this diagram is this, uh, this version 1.2. And that's because Lipid is, um, it's really, it was designed to be really flexible and, and um, expandable to accommodate the growing demands of paleoclimatology. We're a really dynamic field and there's not sort of a static set of needs. And over the past six years that we've been working on this, it's changed a lot. And version 1.2 doesn't really even reflect all those changes. And, and this really came about through this sort of iterative cycle development and has sort of been most rigorously field tested with the pages 2K 
project where we, uh, we started doing stuff and formatting it. And we're like, hey, it'd be really great if we had a place to store this. Or it'd be really great if we could accommodate this situation. And so over and over and over again, um, we've been developing it. And, and it's, I think it's in a really robust, strong place, but I'm 100% sure it's going to keep evolving and adapting to accommodate the kinds of things that we all want to use. OK. And so now maybe the more important question is that's what it is, but you, don't really, you shouldn't really have to care about what it is. But why would I want to use it and what can it do for me? Okay, so one reason you might want to care, you might want to use Lipid, is that there's a really large, growing, and strong data um, set of data now available in, in the Lipid format that are sort of there, ready to analyze, including the page's 2K temperature data set is all there, nice and clean. Um, the, ISO, the growing ISO 2K data set is, um, has this really rich set of metadata, which are all going to be there and queryable in Lipid. Uh, we have we're working on Holocene data, and this is this is growing um, literally daily. So there's more and more data available for you to use. Another reason is that there's more and more tools becoming available that speak Lipid, um, that are able to read and write Lipid files, and then help you do science easier. So one of these is is Linked Earth. You can go on to Linked Earth. You can uh, go find go look to the at the the fancy map, find a data set, download it in Lipid, and then do what you want with it. You can also take a Lipid file that you have and, and upload it and create a new set of pages on the wiki, um, and that's really easy. Um, we have collaborators, uh, Liz Bradley in Boulder has a C science package, which is a, sort of a, a user-friendly um, way of, of, of doing age modeling with a bunch of different tools that keeps track of all your choices. You can store all your methodological choices in that method the section of the chronology data. Um, export the ensemble. Um, this uses this speaks Lipid. Um, uh, Deborah Kider and Julian are developing this PaleoClim package, which is a, uh, a set of tools in Python that do a lot of sophisticated paleoclimate analysis really simply, and, and they read and write Lipid files. Um, so you load it in, and it's, re it's ready to go. Um, this is just a little dashboard diagram that you can load in a file and say, you know plot Lipid and it shows you sort of where this thing is in the world and a first glance of what one of the data sets look like and its distribution of data and what the age model looks like. And this is, this is like one line of code. Um, and a package that at least for me really inspired a lot of the development of Lipid in the first place is the GeoCarn R package, um, which is designed to do age and certain analysis of paleoclimate data. Um, and I thought I'd give one sort of case study because it's hard to come to a pages meeting and not actually talk about any science. <laughs> and so, um, so I, I'm working, we're using GeoCarnar, we're developing GeoCarnar. We had a, a workshop last fall and I'll advertise briefly for another one coming up in August. And at the last workshop, uh, one of my colleagues, Elizabeth Thomas um, at the University of Buffalo um, came and, and sorry about that, she's been working on this project and I've been helping a bit on the GeoCarnar side. And uh, so I'm not gonna go into the details and be a super superficial treatment of the science. So, um, so please feel free to criticize. Um, so this is at this lake in Greenland, the QUE Lake. I think that's how you pronounce it. And uh, it's, you know, it's right there in Western Greenland, and, and it's sensitive to some of these abrupt changes in the early Holocene. Um, she has a GDGT uh, temperature record from this lake. And here's just sort of the first glance of that. We're looking here um, 9,500 years ago to about 7,000 years ago. And we see this really, these, uh, this distinct change here um, pre-8.2 event, but there's some other records in the region which show this. 86, 8,800 year um, step in um, abrupt cooling that then returns. And so Elizabeth's question, what we're trying to look at is, is this cooling synchronous with other cooling in the region? So of course, this is the first way your data looks when you plot it, but, uh, and you can run so a change point detection algorithm and you say, okay, there's the change one. The first change happened at uh, you know, 8,972 years, and the second change happened at 8,173 years. We know that there's a lot of uncertainty, and, and GeoCarnar try, is, is, is built to try to handle that uncertainty. So you can first imagine, say, okay, let's, let's think about the age uncertainty, right? We know our age model isn't perfect, so we can look at our, uh, look at a plot of the same, the same data here, but now we have uncertainty in the X direction. Um, the, the gray shading shows the distribution of those as a function of, uh, you know, the, the distribution essentially how age uncertainty affects your distribution in the Y axis with the red data just showing some traces of what individual ensemble members look like there. And then we can look at a histogram now of our change points. So now we have some uncertainty looking at, looking at that. Um, you could also add in ensemble uncertainty in, in the Y axis. Um, so now we're looking at uncertainty both in the uh, temperature calibration and, the, and in the age uncertainty, and we're looking at the, how that affects those change points because we're running it all, all through there. And, and all of this is literally 
maybe a dozen lines of code in GeoCronR. So this is the kind of thing that GeoCronR is built to do, and you start doing this by loading in a lipid file, and then when you're done, you can write out a lipid file, and it has all your ensembles and everything in it. So that's something that, uh, that sounds appealing to you, that's something you're interested in. Um, you should check out the package for sure, and that's again close to having its first formal release, but we're also having this training workshop in August in Flagstaff, um, and Flagstaff's a great place in August. So join us if you can. Um, And then the last set of tools, and really a more broad set of tools I was going to talk about, is, is what we call the lipid utilities. And these are just um, functions in, uh, a, a, it's a set of functionality in Python and R and in MATLAB that lets you load and uh, read and write lipid files into those programming languages and then do some basic analysis uh, with it. Not analysis, some basic manipulation with it. So um, you can query across the, you know, whatever the metadata you have in there, you can query and extract. You can um, work with a bunch of data. Um, at once um, and sort of manipulate your data. This is, uh, this is what, what I use in, the, in various pages projects to do database management essentially and query and uh, data curation. Um, and it's also the, sort of the foundation for a lot of these tools and if you want to do some sort of custom analysis of your data, this is sort of sitting there so you can not ever have to look at the guts of a lipid file but then still pull it in and reap all the benefits. Okay. Um, and then uh, lastly, so we've been working with NOAA Paleoclimatology, um, which is uh, I think now the National Center for Environmental Information um, is, is the current name. And, uh, and we've been working with them on ma making, you know, being compatible with what we're doing with Lipid and what they're doing. And they're moving towards and are actually getting really close to being, being ready to accept Lipid files as a submission format. So if you've been doing all your work in Lipid files, Rather than having to to put this into their their format to send it, you can you can essentially now is there's not a button there, but if you send them an email, say I have this lipid file, they're ready to accept that. They're starting to archive lipid files in addition to their native format on Noah Paleo. So we're really excited about that partnership, and hopefully we can avoid having to proliferate these types of uh, types of formats. The other thing that that we're doing, and and Emily uh, mentioned this as well, is that we're uh, they're um, working towards standardizing but their voc the vocabulary for a lot of the data sets in their, in their holdings, trying to have standardized terms for a whole bunch of things. Um, and it's really important to note that what, what Lipid is fundamentally is, is it's a d data container, it's a standard, and, you could, and there's, it's, it, um, it's, it's a data format. It's not a data standard, there's no real constraint on what you call things, and um, the, having a standardized vocabulary it was really important to be able to search things and reuse things as the kind of thing that we, we were working with them to try to adopt. Um, and build on. Okay, that's all great. So, but if you, uh, so hopefully I've convinced you that there's some utility here, but uh, until recently it's been, it's been a little difficult to actually get your data into, into Lipid and have that work really well. Um, but now we, I'm really excited to say we have a couple options which are really good. So, uh, so uh, Deborah Kider um, built this really robust Excel template. So if you like using Excel, your data in Excel, you can, uh, you can go through here, you can fill this all out. This is really especially built for Linked Earth Wiki, so it has all the requirements you need um, and kind of walks you through that. Um, so that's, that's out there, available, and it works. Um, and then the other option is, uh, this, this, this is a video because I didn't trust the web to work, <laughs> um, that shows this online uh, um, Lipid file creator that we have on Lipid.net. So um, what Chris is doing here in the video is he's copying and pasting from some Excel data into this web form on its Lipid.net. Um, Website, so he's pasting in the funding information. This is the best part. So you push add publication, he's gonna paste in the DOI and push resolve, and it just populates all the fields. This actually works, so you can go and do that. It didn't get the journal, so he just pasted that in. Um, you can type in the, uh, the coordinates there, um, and then when you go back up to the top, it'll show your site on the map, and you'll be able to tell if you made a mistake when you're typing in your coordinates. You do what I do sometimes, and forget to put the negative in front of the longitude. You can see that really obviously, and your Minnesota site ends up in Mongolia. Um, that's a true story. Um, true story. You just copy and paste in your actual data. Um, it will parse it into columns, and then you can go through column by column and describe it. So what's this thing called? What are the units? Um, you can take a look at it. You can describe a whole bunch of other metadata that are available. You can make up your own metadata if you want. Um, hopefully we can agree on some of the terms for that. Um, you have to go through some capture things, apparently, to be able to download it. But then when you do, you can you download it, and you see the Lipid file pops down to your computer, and then he's going to show you the guts of it. But again, you would never actually have to look inside the guts of this Lipid file. 
So really excited about this tool. It's new. You can go check it out today and see if you can break the website. It's a good chance it might break, but it's gonna, it works. It works. And we're really excited about it. Okay. So that's, that's all I have for you today. And I just want to thank everybody. This has been a hugely collaborative project with lots of input from all of the pages groups, but also from our friends at Neotoma and at NOAA. And um, it's been supported really broadly. So it's, it's been, we're excited about how far this has come over the past half decade. Yeah, I was interested in the, the um, chronology tools that you've got in um, built in. I was just wondering, have you got tools that are able to work with annually annual chronologies or? Yeah. Is, yep. And yeah. So GeoChronar works with um, it, it. It's sort of a wrapper around published. So we're not doing any sort of new age modeling stuff. But if, if it exists and it's ensemble based, we're trying to incorporate it. So we have um, the low res stuff like uh, Bacon and um, Bcron, but we also have BAM to do um, uncertainty on annually banded sediments, and we can you can do the same analysis with the, just a different age modeling tool. I'll steal a question slot to just give a plug because I was at the, the workshop last August. It's really great. You should encourage your students to go. Uh, the Geochron R is really usable with some help in my case. <laughs> I wasn't really excellent at using R before I went. And uh, it certainly opened my eyes to how important age and certain analysis is. Thanks. I'm really glad you had positive things to say right then. <laughs> I'm presenting uh, the, this ACER pollen and charcoal da database. It's a global resource to, doc to document vegetation and fire response to the abrupt climatic changes of the last glacial period, a period that uh, started 73,000 years before present up to uh, 15,000 years before present. First, I would like to thank uh, the co-authors uh, and also the contributor to, to this database, and in particular, Stephanie Despra, who managed to do the age models, and Anne-Laure Daniel, who uh, is the person who managed really the database. You know that uh, the last glacial period uh, was uh, marked by uh, rapid climatic changes that we call the Dansgaroesger uh, cycles that occur every 1,000, 2,000 years. And these climatic changes were, uh, were uh, very rapid and large in magnitude. In particular, the Dansgaroesger warming event uh, uh, had a magnitude between 6 and 16 degrees in, in Greenland temperature and occurred in a few decades. The cooling event were more uh, progressive, uh, but uh, they were also uh, quite uh, abrupt at the end and were associated with uh, freshwater pulses um, 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 due to the fragmentation of the iceberg, the North American and the North European icebergs. The Dansgar Oesger warming event are in particular uh, very interesting uh, because uh, they are in magnitude and rapidity very similar to the present day global warming. And therefore, uh, we can use these past rapid climatic changes as test bed uh, to uh, know the ability of vegetation to adapt or migrate also to understand the potential feedbacks of rapid fire and vegetation response uh, on climate through changes in albedo and greenhouse gases. And finally, also to evaluate the regional uh, climate simulation forced by freshwater pulses. It is for this reason that uh, uh, in 2008, we started to uh, compile uh, the pollen and charcoal uh, record at a global scale, and we uh, published this uh, first compilation in a special issue in Quaternary Science Reviews that uh, was published in 2010. Here you can see all the contributors of this uh, special issue. Uh, the problem uh, was that this compilation, the synthesis, was qualitative. We compare changes in pollen percentages, changes in more or less uh, ve uh, vegetation cover. Uh, but the main problem was that it, uh, all these pollen record and charcoal record were based on independent chronologies. These independent chronologies, it means that 
each record uh, had different calibration curves. Certain record in Cal over Fairbanks 05, and very important also that this record had different event stratigraphy. I mean different po uh, control points. Some based on GRIPS, CZ09, other GIPS2, uh, North GRIPS, and so on. Therefore, when you want to know the, uh, the vegetation response, the climate response at regional, at global level, to a, 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 a given climatic change, uh, there is a mess. This is quite unrealistic, you know, the, this, this comparison. And this is for this reason that uh, we launch uh, a, a project under the umbrella of INQUA, the ACER, uh, International Focus Group, Approved Climate Changes and envir Environmental Responses. And the, the aim of this uh, project was to harmonize the chronologies of the pollen and charcoal records. And uh, after that, uh, to create a, a database, a proper database, to make biomization and quantitative reconstruction of, uh, of, of the climate, vegetation and climate. And here is the, uh, this, this compilation. They are the result of the database. We have compiled 93 pollen records from the last glacial period, 32 of which also provide charcoal records. Here you can see the distribution of this pollen and charcoal record. More or less we have uh, the uh, pollen and charcoal record for all the different regions uh, of, the, uh, of the world, but uh, there are large regions without, uh, sorry, with no data at all, unfortunately. The temporal resolution of the record are better than 1,000 years because with this resolution we can catch the millennial scale climatic variability, but uh, it's, it's, it's also it's, oh, it's, it's not so good as the, uh, you know, the resolution of uh, corals, but anyway, for us it's quite a good resolution. Here you can see the structure of the database that is in Microsoft Access. We hear the site, the dating information, sample, uh, the pollen data, uh, uh, but um, this <coughs> pollen data is as raw pollen counting. Eh? But uh, we, we, we want, in fact, that this database uh, be used by a lot of uh, people, not only palynologists, Okay, we want that this database be used by a paleoceanographer, people working on ice core, modelers, and for this reason, we add to this database also the percentages of the major ecological groups that they, uh, they indicate changes in climate. Uh, this that, and, uh, and you have here the, uh, this uh, information about the biome percentages. This database is, uh, will be available at uh, Pangea, and I know that a lot of people don't like to match this uh, Microsoft Access structure. And therefore, uh, also we have CSV files. Here's an example of the uh, biome percentages. Uh, we, for instance, for U Europe, we have only uh, the temperate forest indicating warming and humid climate. But for instance, for Eastern Asia, we have the percentages of the boreal forest, temperate forest, warm temperate forest, subtropical forest, and grassland. How we uh, deal with the, uh, um, how we harmonize these uh, uh, chronologies? Uh, we establish uh, a few major guidelines. First, uh, we use uh, uh, mainly radiometric uh, carbon, uh, uh, for, sorry, 14 uh, carbon ages when available, but you know that uh, the limit of this uh, radio, uh, carbon-14 is uh, uh, only 40,000 years, and therefore we need also uh, to use argon-argon uh, uh, and OSL of tephra layers, and also some record are dated by uh, uranium-thorium. We also added the uncertainties of all the ages, and where, uh, when there was no radiometric dating, we apply an age model based on even stratigraphy, and this was because uh, um, it, it, it has been found a, a similarity of the planktonic for Aminifera Delta OIT uh, record from an Iberian margin core, MD 40, uh, 95 2042, and the Dansgaard Oeschger cycles. And this similarity allowed the identification of Dansgaard Oeschger cycle in the marine realm. 
And this, uh, uh, this record was directly compared with the pollen percentage curve, giving an age to the later. Mm? And uh, then we, we, uh, this, uh, in fact, allow us really to be confident on this event stratigraphy for pollen records and charcoal records. And finally, we use the last stage model for the Greenland ice core, the GICC05, um, but before 1950, because uh, we have uh, also uh, control, control points uh, with uh, uh, carbon-14. The methodology was uh, uh, based on the, the, the use of the CLAM so software and privileged linear interpolation. But sometimes with linear interpolation, we had a lot of outliers. And in, in these cases, also we use a smooth spline or uh, different polynomial. Um, we calibrate with Intra 13 and Marine 13 uh, for terrestrial and marine samples, respectively. And uh, for marine samples, we calculated the reservoir age using the marine reservoir correction database in Calib. Uh, um, and for most of the site, we selected the closest 20 site within 1,000 kilometer distance to the specific site. But we didn't take into account the temporal variation of the delta uh, reservoir age, because this is really unknown. Here is an example of the event stratigraphy. Here you can see the chronology, uh, the point controls um, of the, uh, for the Dansgar Oeschger warming event. Here you can see the uh, name of the tephra layers. Here is the ages based on carbon-14, and here the ages of the tephra layers based on uh, argon-argon. And here the associated uncertainties. Here is for be between the mid-Holocene to dansgar oeschger 11, uh, and here from uh, dansgar oeschger 12, to the uh, transition between marine isotope state six and five, because we needed sometimes a constraint at the base of the core. Here you can see uh, the, some examples of, the, of, of this age model. Here uh, from uh, uh, two uh, marine core in the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, it, the, the black line is the new age model, the red line is the previous, the original age model proposed by the authors. And for this marine core, you see that they, is, they are quite similar. But in the other case, for instance, for uh, Valle di Castiglione in Italy or Touche Basin in Taiwan, uh, you can see that the uh, age model are quite uh, different. Here is an example of uh, uh, six pollen and charcoal record, uh, veg uh, vegetation in, uh, pollen record in green, uh, charcoal record in orange, and um, uh, you can see that this the, all these records uh, are harmonized. Eh? This, uh, they, they have the same uh, chronology. You can see that uh, uh, you, um, the, you can observe uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the abrupt uh, pollen percentage changes during the last uh, glacial uh, period, and uh, at in more long term, uh, you can see the opposite behavior of the curves in the Caledonia Fen in Australia, and here in the Touche, Touche Basin, certainly indicating the opposite behavior of the ITCZ in this area. Finally, this is to do some uh, publicity to this uh, uh, pollen uh, and charcoal da database, uh, because this is the this is the paper associated with the database that is now under discussion in uh, Earth System uh, Science uh, data. And here uh, you can see all the contributors uh, to, to this uh, database. Thank you very much. How did you design things so that it would be easy to query and find the records that people want? Uh, did you have to do a lot of standardizing the names and the way things were called? Yes. Okay. Also after for the, uh, 
But everything is in CS, CS, CSV files. Well, I guess I'm... The, the, the individual records presumably all used slightly different terminologies. So how did you decide? No, 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 no. In fact, for the following taxa, there is a standardization. Oh, okay. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah, and it's a big job. It's a big job. Do you mean you did the standardization? Yes. Okay, that's what I wanted you to say, yeah. And, and, and how much time did you spend on that? You know, first with this, this uh, uh, qualitative compilation uh, and after more quantitative compilation. This is 2008. <coughs> Standardization takes time. Yes, <laughs> yes and fashion. Yes. Because when I, when I, I heard, I listened to your talk, mm. yes, I was in Atmel. It, it, won't ha it won't have to be a nightmare for the people who come after you. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, okay, so thank you to all the speakers for your very interesting contributions and discussions. And uh, we now have time, about uh, one hour, uh, to have an open discussion on uh, the topic of on the topic of data stewardship. You know that uh, we had a discussion already uh, two days ago on the role of pages altogether. Uh, what uh, pages is, what it may be, where does it get its funding from, etc. And uh, this is also related to it in terms of uh, what pages can do or should do for the community. Um, we feel in a, in a slightly ambiguous position. We feel that uh, the area of uh, data stewardship is very important and it's important that somebody takes the lead to make sure that we have standards, uh, worldwide standards that can be followed. On the other hand, we don't know whether PAGES is mandated by the international community to do that. So this is perhaps the starting point for the discussion that, uh, that we have in here and we are looking forward to any contributions in this or related topics. So perhaps we can start by clarifying what we mean by standards, right? So wh what does a standard mean to you guys? What, so what, 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 what needs to be standardized? You need a common format that's good enough for you to access the data in the same way, really, any any bit of data, and then uh, and then then analyze it. Uh, okay, so it's a, so it's a format. So it yeah. turns out, you know, I think we can learn a lot from what the modeling community did, and so they have you know all the climate models. The output comes out in NetCDF format, and so the container, the format is the same, but what things are called inside is not, and that was a it's not standardized, yeah. right? So. These are two different things, in my opinion. So, you know, Nick showed you Lipid is one type of container in which you can stuff your data. Another one would be a Microsoft Access, whatever. And, you know, there's some value in harmonizing those things, but that's not enough, right? If we're not disciplined about the way we call things, it doesn't matter that we all use the same format. If everybody spells Delta 18, you know, 11 different ways, you have to write 11 different queries to be able to find what you want. So one part of standardization, I think, is somewhat different from that. I think formats are very important, but it's only about half of the story or even less than that. The other half is to get people to agree on common terminology. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I think I was just going to, actually you said what I was thinking, <laughs> so it's, it's relatively easy to write a script or to write a function to transfer between one archive and the next format. The format interchange is the easy part, it's that everything is named differently that is the problem. Yeah. So I don't, I knew in the paleo data, but before it was lake ecology data and like every German land, every land that calls it, the lakes a different name or the species a different name and the same even the same one changes the name from one year to the next. And so this is the problem. Switching between formats is relatively easy. Okay. 
about this. I'll just comment on it in the meantime, because this is touching on an important point, and that's data discovery. And I, and I think we are now two decades into ar archiving of data, and that's working fine. I think there's no problem. There are many different formats and containers, but we are now entering the era of big data, and the big question, I think, is in how in that archive discover what, what you need. Um, did you say in, in an earlier talk, Julian, that um, you, you could format uh, it to, um, to, to search on multiple versions of the, of the same way, of the way in which a certain thing can be expressed? In other words, if you've got Delta 8, you know, expressed in multiple different ways. So I have trouble hearing you, oh, sorry. sorry. Can you yeah. can it, is this working? Okay, um, for example, if you have um, Delta 8, you know, expressed in multiple different ways, right. you know, you've got thousands of scientists doing it in their own way, you can uh, essentially set up a search uh, uh, program to search through all the various versions of that, of that terminology. Yes, yeah, so, so I guess there's various approaches to that. One aspect is recognizing there is currently no standardization. So you can sort of teach a computer that oh, all these things that are called A, B, C, and D, they're really all the same thing. So that's one way. But I think ultimately moving forward, it would be much more efficient if we all agreed on the common terminology. Uh, and that's part of you know what we had to do with Lipid is I mean, for the, the pages 2K data set is, is a good example because there was sort of a, a manageable amount of people. There was mostly one person in charge and he's sitting right there. Um, and so, you know, he sort of centralized this and he said, okay, we're going to call, you know, whatever medium the climate uh, information is stored in, we're going to call this archive type. And so all of the files in there have this same thing. So it's easy to do a query. I want archive type equals tree or you know, marine sediment. Uh, but it's not necessarily the case when you start, when we have a distributed network of scientists and they all, you know, everybody who uploads things to NOAA or Pangea has the liberty to put ev almost everything they, they want in there. So I, I think to me, one of the important things that we can do as a community, and I think Pages is in a great position to do that, is start a discussion on that. And that's one reason why we set up Linked Earth the way we did as a, you know, a wiki, a very, very bottom up um, and environment. The other thing I will say is that uh, I'd, I don't know about Pangea, actually, if there is anybody here who has any relation to Pangea, I'd love to be in touch. But with NOAA, as well, um, NOAA we have a fairly close partnership with. And what they told us is, well, we did not even want to impose a standard on people. We wanted that to come from the community. And, and they, they told us, we will adopt whatever the community wants to do. And you're the community. Okay. So I, I, you're, I can, in, you're I in the driver's one. seat. I can speak for Pangea in this, in this sense. They, they would have the same answer. Is that, of course, it would be very easy to implement a system where once you are uploading your data, you would have to identify from a drop-down list uh, of 20 allowed names of what your parameter is, etc. But how do we <coughs> in Pangea know what is the correct list of parameters? Somebody that has credible, uh, some organization or whoever, has to come with us and say that this is the standard and then it can be implemented relatively easily. So this is precisely the difference between the, the providers of the data services and the community that, that generates the data and has the knowledge. I just wanted to say like, you know, that to totally agree is why you know, we start with mop up, we like, let's find names, but something, I think people like in your situation for, tend to forget it that we just need guidance actually, like you know, Noah says, you know, oh, do whatever you want, but that's really why we don't want to put more in Noah, because like, especially put whatever we want. But we just need, you know, like you show on the Excel file, just tell us what to put, that's also the issue, because I call something a certain name, and somebody called the exact same thing a different name, and then we don't know what I'm supposed to, to enter, and therefore if, you're not, if you don't know what to enter, you just don't enter anything, and just leave. That's what I felt my first time going through the Noah website, and they asked for some, and to hear all the information you think is useful. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. The paper? Like mm. I, I, I didn't know, and I think that's why. I think people, we enter as much information as you ask them to enter because they understand and they would just do it. Like what you show, you know, going from the Excel file, entering information, they would do it. If they know what it is, they would do it. We just have to tell them what it is and what it meant and make it really easy for them to, un to understand. 
Yes, yeah, so just a quick reply to that. There's a, there's a whole spectrum of what information we want to provide, right? There's sort of a minimum without which you can't, uh, you can't call something a paleo climate data set. You know, it at least needs to have a time axis and something that you measured and a name and perhaps even an author, right? And, and coordinates. And without those things, you can't really call it. But then what's the other end? As you say, you know, what is useful? Okay, well, you, you know, you just upload your paper maybe and like everything that's in there yeah. is useful. So where is the boundary? And what we found in, in Pages 2K uh, and other applications is that what guides that is what science you want to do with your data, right? If all you have is what Noah has, which is you have the author name and the, the year and the name of the site, that's all you can query on. And it's a fundamental limitation. Now, if you start to query on archives, like I want all the annually resolved marine archives, you need to have a way to say that. If you need to have the coordinates and so on and so forth. And if you want to do more sophisticated analysis, it means that people have to start saving different things. So. Um, that's also part, I think, of the standardization is the community has to come to an agreement as to what is the most useful information that we should recommend, what are the best practices. And we tell people, look, it's fine if you submit your, chrono you know, if you submit your paleo data as, you know, something versus time, but what we really like is if you archive the depth, because that's what you actually measured, and the time is something you inferred, and, and as, as you pointed out, you know, calibrations change all the time. And so in 20 years, there will be another radiocarbon calibration and you'll have to do the age modeling all over again. And, you know, I can't tell you a number of times I've had discussions with, uh, with people who are like, oh, you, you care about depth? Or you care about magnesium calcium? You don't want just the temperature? And it didn't even occur to them. But if you tell people, no, we actually want this, or, you know, data lives forever. The, the, you know, some data that were measured 50 years ago, uh, will still be used 100 years from now, perhaps. Uh, the interpretation may have changed, you know, the age models may have changed, but the actual measurements are incredibly valuable. And so I think that's uh, something that each of the communities, mostly, you know, the speleothem folks and the marine folks and the coral folks need to decide what is important for people to best reuse our data. And it has to be, as you say, a dialogue with the, uh, the data services you know the, the agencies because they're looking to guidance from you, you you're looking to guidance from them so you should all spend some time together in the room yes this gentleman. can you state your name please yeah michael Kahle. Uh, i think one of the problems is also that if you talk about standardizing um that you have to think across the communities uh, so mm -hmm. of course if you do tree rings then you have other expectations from the data or maybe then from from other archives and so you, you of course the community is important but someone must somehow integrate it and I think everybody must be um, able to have some compromises uh, and say okay to get really the most value out of it and to, to combine all the data we, we have to maybe don't have our most favorite or most uh, used practice but but we also have to, to adapt a little bit. Uh, so this is, I think, the, the trick on it. And that's why maybe because why, why people uh, fear about uh, going to another standard or whatever. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm more a computer scientist. And that's what I feel. Yeah. When, I, when I try to standardize data, then, then often there are complaints. Um, it's, this is the hard thing, I guess. Yeah, it, it's a tough, it's a tough problem. We have actually in Linked Earth there is a cross archive metadata working group, which is precisely for that purpose. And there's also a couple of longitudinal working groups, like there's a chronologies working group, because all of these records have chronologies, right? And there's an uncertainties working group because we all deal with uncertainties and it's important to standardize the way we frame these things. And the idea is that people from different communities start talking to each other like, oh, that's how you report your chronology. Oh, I call this thing some other thing. And then maybe by having that dialogue, we, we come to a compromise. Mike. So another thing that might be useful in a, in a standard format is the ability for that format to be flexible to emergence uh, variables mm -hmm. or, or metadata. Um, so you gave, you gave an example of, of depth uh, that is uh, behind the age model that may be already um, for the 
use. Can you bring the mic closer oh, to you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Another mic. So, an, so the, the the question was, or the I guess the, the request was that for a format that is is dynamically flexible to new information, both observation and and metadata. In fact, in, in all of the um, mm -hmm. in all of the pieces of the lipid, uh, you know, the four components of the lipid structure. Um, another example might be uh, for data which does not have an age model for one reason or another. There may be a lot of data that might be useful because for some application we haven't foreseen, there is actually no need for an age model. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that I, I hope that's an attribute of a format that, uh, that, that could, be, could be built. Do, do you follow the, the question? I, guess? I think so, and if I understand you right, that already exists. Right? <laughs> Within Lipid? As long as you're actually only adding fields that they don't already exist. Yeah. Uh, Diane, Jean-Yves, I, I think Lucien had his hand up first. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess my turn. Um, I, I can give you some input from the modeling community about what we use for standards. So there is a there is a document uh, called the Climate and Forecast Convention right. uh, that tells you what the standards are or how you can make the s new standards if need be, and uh, we well it goes to the units of the variables for instance how they should be written, uh, and if you have a temperature uh, we have to use Kelvin. So I don't know, for instance, in the data community, if you use Celsius or Kelvin. Yes. Celsius? Everything. More than you can imagine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> for the models, you have to use uh, you have to use Kelvin's. And um, if you if you are using uh, using a speed, for instance, it has to be written uh, not. Uh, M slash S, but M space uh, S minus one. <laughs> so, and if you need new units, uh, it will be uh, derived from this kind of rule. And um, regarding your problem with uh, how to write delta, uh, delta, delta O18, for instance. Oh, delta. Yeah, yeah delta. <laughs> yeah. Um, usually we work with the concept of uh, controlled vocabulary. Mm -hmm. which means that uh, if we represent uh, something, it has to be taken from an existing list that people have agreed on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how, my question to you is, how did the climate community agree on these CF standards? Who, who decided on, that, on those lists and that nomenclature? Well, for before it's called CF, before it was called uh, GDT, so there, there, have been, uh, there have been people working on the first draft, and then it has evolved from there. And um, for, for instance, for naming uh, new variables, there is a mailing list where people can talk about what uh, the, the names of the variables would be because we have short names and long names. And um, if you are making um, area means or special, well, special means or temporal means or doing some operations, there, is a, there, is, there are some standard way to, to describe those operations and it will be a, it will be some metadata that we add to the variable. Right. So, in other words, there's a community and there's a way for the community to discuss and to yes. make decisions. Mm. And that's critical, right? And until now, we didn't really have something like in the paleo community. You know, linked earth is one way to do that. It's not the only way. I just don't know of any other way that anybody has proposed. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's what you said is, you know, if you st study the 
history of standards in any field, there's essentially two approaches. There's a top-down approach, which you know the European Union is very fond of that. It's like you know every door should be made to specifications like this, and mm. if you're going to make a door, it should have these specifications. Or they are community-based standards, and so it's up to a community to define what they call things, and 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 then you know it takes a bit longer, but then it's usually broader acceptance because it's more useful to the community. The concludes. So we have got Lucien, <coughs> right, first. Yeah. Yeah. Back. yeah, do you want? Yeah. Yeah. the harmonization of the names of the pollen of the, the, uh, you know, around the world, in fact, uh, this, is, this, is, this uh, uh, started well before 2008. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, uh, each um, uh, um, um, regional pollen community meet, uh, met for, uh, for choosing the, the, the good uh, terms mm -hmm. for pollen. And in the case of the Mediterranean, uh, I think that the last uh, uh, standardiza standardization finally was done by two persons mm -hmm. of, the, of the region, you know? The, and it's really is a, is a, is a long term, for, at least for this pollen stuff. And after, um, what we, we did first uh, was to uh, create a, a workbook, a workbook with uh, uh, different columns, with the depth, uh, uh, the, the, um, the radiometric dating, and in each uh, uh, column of an Excel file, there was a menu. Yeah, so it, it's a and template you're describing. Yeah, it's a template, right? Yes. Yeah, and so em Emily has a similar template for MARPA, Laia has a similar template for, for Speleothems. But after that, there is a, a, you know, you have a column with a standardized pollen taxa names, and you have to change the names, you know, for each of the pollen record. Yeah, so you have a menu, a menu yeah, yeah, of yeah. options, yeah. yeah. But it's after the collection. Okay. You know, there is, a, 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 in this case, was Anelok Daniel, who did that, you know, to change for each mm. site, to transform, in fact, mm. the original name given by the author to the, uh, to the, to the standardized name. It takes work. Uh, Diane and then Lucien. Sorry, Lucien. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too far in the back. I'll yeah. make it quick. This is actually sort of building up re what you were just talking about earlier, Julian, and more is a comment than a the question. But, um, you know, like speaking of the top down, bottom up approach, I love that, that Links Earth has been a bottom up approach. But ultimately, like with my experience, with little experience with pages in ICTK, um, being heavily involved in that, ultimately some of these decisions have to come down to a few people who are making executive leadership decisions on should we call Delta 18 X, Y, or Z? Like ultimately that's not, those sorts of decisions aren't a group effort and there's a Herculean amount of effort being done by a very small amount of people who are in this room. And so I guess my comment is A, thank you because it's a thankless job. And um, you know, as much as I can say thank you, that doesn't really like help. <laughs> um, I, I hope that you guys know that it's it's we really appreciate it. But my larger comment is, can there be in terms of I, and I missed the discussion the other day. I was still in class, but in terms of role of pages or the role of the community in this, can there be some sort of structure with there it, there being actually um, some sort of of um, support for this effort, not necessarily monetary, I'm saying like a letter that can go into somebody's tenure file, for example, because a lot of people that are going and doing this effort are pre-tenure. And to be honest, like it's thankless. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't been that heavily involved because I realize that it's not something that's gonna be appreciated. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a number of people that have been doing a ton of effort. Um, and I want to make sure that that's acknowledged on a level that I don't think it is. So A, thank you. B, something to think about. Um, this room is actually pretty empty and that says something as well, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Uh, if, if we have time in a, you know, towards the end, maybe I can uh, give you a little 
tour of linked earth and like a quick demo and i can show you um so like any wiki if you go on wikipedia um you know you have actually wikipedia doesn't have a ton of that if you go on our wiki uh we track all the contributions we track all the edits and uh you know if you have a page there can't you remember if you do or emily, emily has a page yeah. Okay, so if you go to Emily's page, for example, you have like uh, kind of a profile of how many data sets she's uploaded and how many uh, pages she's edited and things like that. And, um, w and we are working on making some kind of easy visualizations of, you know, for certain things, like how many people provided input to this page, you know, kind of like pie charts and like simple visualizations. Um, and one of these objectives is to be able to show, like you can put that in your CV, you know, the, uh, you know, quick link to some things like this. I'm, this is a community service. You know, I'm doing this, and there's a way to kind of metricize that. And as usual, you know, the rest of the world has to sort of catch up to that. It's the same thing with data DOIs, right? Data citations. We keep saying, oh, we have to have a mechanism for data citations. It turns out there's right now no way to officially really recognize them. You know, even the editor of scientific data doesn't truly know what happens to data citations and whether they, you know whether tenure committees are ever going to consider them. But we have to start somewhere. So at least with the wiki, there will be a way to track contributions so that it's not completely thankless. You know? So it's known that Deborah has 4,000 edits, and you know, it's very clear that she's the one who did all the work. Okay. Lucien, finally. Yes. <laughs> Taking pictures of me, sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm Lucien from Pages, uh, the IPO, so International Project Office in Bern. So I really appreciate this discussion here, and I also like very much that Pages could play a role in setting up um, standards, for example. So uh, that's certainly something that is in our interest and that we want to push. Um, so we had presentation from at least three projects now, all working with um, with the same ideas on different aspects, different time scale, different. Um, ways to deal with it. Um, it seems that one point that all agree on is that we need some um, to discuss on a community-based way um, the language that we want to talk. So find out about so basically what you, what you propose with your uh, linked earth approach to to use the community to come up with uh, with standards. Um, now, we are very much in favor of pushing, advertising such an effort from the page's official site. Um, what is sometimes difficult is to, to really get people on board. And especially now, only in this room, we already have three different projects, all that are maybe limited in time, that come from different communities, that have slightly different interests. Um, so it, it, you are talking together. That's already a, a good start. It's it's not obvious because it's also in concurrence, each one with another. So if there would be a clear way to communicate that actually Marpa is not a concurrence to 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 linked earth or to to Asia, uh, Asia, but so if there would be a common message that all these projects are actually willing to support um, an effort to create such standards. I think that could be very helpful for the community so, so that they don't have to choose one side or the other. And I think many people are enthusiastic about what you're doing, especially people that are involved in the Pages Working Group because they are very close to, to our heart and they know we are pushing this and they know why we are pushing this. But the rest of the community is probably not that convinced yet about either of these projects and probably you know i don't say that the projects have to merge but at least have a common communication could be very helpful thank you for that i mean one thing that would help from pages perhaps is a communication that data standardization is really important and that you know, to facilitate calls for doing that, even perhaps workshops. I mean, I know it's not super sexy, but you know, we're in co 
competition right now with other science sessions, and it's clear that most people want to go to a science talk rather than a data management talk. You know, there's not much con contest there. So I really appreciate that all of you have stayed for this long. Uh, but one thing that could happen maybe is to say, look, if you don't take part in a data standard, you're going to have to accept whatever is thrown at you. Because what, can, what can, I can easily imagine is people having complaints later. And so maybe we need to put deadlines and say, you know, we're going to have rain or shine. You know, there's going to be something proposed and adopted by this date. And if you don't provide input, you don't get to complain later. I just wanted to comment at what you say with your, I don't think MAPA and Linkers are in competition. Actually, MAPA is like the bottom of, I mean, I see myself like, well, we want standard and well, we are the best one to say what we need because we work with the calls. I mean, I mean, and really with our proxy archive. And our goal was just to, at some, before Linkers, you know, started, uh, it was to work with already existing infrastructure to be like, okay, could you just have a comment template for a way to put the comment in there so when you, want to extract them, we know what we extract. And I think, yeah, I think, and then I comment to the second thing you said that, yes, I think it'd be great that everybody, you know, that there is a more power for every small community that they came up with their own idea of what they want. And then, you know, it could be merged, you know, linked us with Benja or Noah or all three together. I don't really care as long as the data are somewhere in a good format that we could actually extract them and put them easily also on. And I think, yeah, it'd be great to everybody, you know, get together and discuss that. And you're right, like not everybody could have their, their say because if they don't say, then it happens. It's what happened with Caesar that we send information saying, okay, we think that information is needed. What do you think? Don't say anything, then that's how it's gonna be. Let me know. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, pre I appreciate what you said, Lucien, that there needs to be broader coordination. And this is a useful session. I would have not known about the ASSER, you know, Poland database without, without your talk. And yeah, you're right that we can probably try to put out <laughs> more broader calls to participation. Uh, you know, Pages seems an ideal platform to at least come and start discussing these things, but we should identify who might be the other relevant players and try to incorporate them. This gentleman has had his hand uh, in, the, in the air for a little while. Thank you. My name is Pierre Frankus. Uh, I used to lead um, a little effort to have a, a VAR uh, database, and for the moment, it's just in the practically it's only on the, on, uh, as an Excel spreadsheet. But we are moving into uh, my or OpenSQL for a database. I didn't have a chance to prepare a talk for, uh, for for this session because I had another talk at the same time. <laughs> so sorry. Um, I, w I wanted to comment about uh, this deadline that you were uh, suggesting, and uh, I'm uh, for this idea of a deadline, but also against, uh, in a sense that I think you need to give the chance the people to try the system before they can comment it, and be before having uh, a final, uh, final decision on the final format or, or, or whatever. And uh, one way to do it is to provide, I would say, a system that can be uh, uploaded on your own computer and you can try it at home and you can maybe ask a couple of students, say, hey, uh, how do you think of uh, this uh, lipid format? Is it useful information? Is it practical? Uh, let's say, for instance, if you have a drop-down menu, menu in Excel, that's fine because it, it, it's, it's really uh, making the names uh, uniform, but if you have a drop-down menu of 50 names and your uh, your selection is the last one, it's going to be a pain in the sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So that's um, what I wanted to see. Right. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, so it's one argument for having a deadline is that if we don't provide one, this is always the last priority on everyone's list, right? Um, unfortunately, that's the way it goes. And, you know, it's kind of like taxes, right? That's why I always do them the, you know, the, the week before. Uh, and you need a deadline for that. And that's why the IPCC has deadlines. I mean, you know, let's, let's be realistic. Um, now, to, in terms of having enough time to get people to test out, you know, what should they be testing out? I mean, again, in my view, Lipid, it's just a container. The technologies that come with it, you know, they're fine, but that's, and it's fine if people test them, but that's not what we're asking people here to provide input on. It's the names, the standardization. Um, so in a way, there's less to test there. You, you, you know, we have these working groups on the wiki. There's one on lakes, for example, and it's just really a wiki page. Most of them are not that big, and some of them are, you know, the marine sediments ones, for example. The speedlithium actually has a lot. Maybe I'll, I'll just show you in a minute. It has a lot of polls, has a lot of things that you can vote on already. And our approach has always been, instead of starting in a vacuum, you propose something, and then people can test it out, as you say, or they can say, oh, well, I disagree. Uh, the question is, yeah, how long of a period do we give for input? Is it going to be two years or, you know? I filled in your polls yesterday uh, during, during another session or during lunchtime, I don't remember. But uh, can we make really a decision when only two people or three people have answered the poll? I'm not sure we can. So it's a good question, actually. What would you consider to be a, a critical mass? You know, how many people does it take? In, to answer a poll so that the community recognizes this as the community has spoken. Is it 100 people? Is it 10? Is it 2,000? I mean, what's the first thing that comes to, you, to your mind? I think this, this, is, this is a question of, uh, of, of the sort of legitimization or something, right? So who, is, uh, who has the mandate to speak for the community? And uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the problem is that there are parallel efforts running somehow, and uh, we all agree that we need some some list of names, and I would also agree that it is much less of a problem in, in which Excel sheet you're putting it, as long as you're naming your variable with the, with the correct name, and as long as Pangea and, uh, and Noah only allow you to upload the data if you, have, if you have a name for the variable that they recognize, and that's relatively easy to implement, I think, but uh, the, the critical thing is who decides on when this list is closed? Mm -hmm. Who moderates the discussion across the community? Uh, that uh, then comes to this conclusion and will be recognized by Pangea and Noah as the body that uh, is, is mandated to make that decision. That, that is the core, I think, in here. We send the template out and people actually were commenting. And I felt like it's easy to comment on something you actually have on your computer yeah. and see. Then on LinkedIn, we just have the proof because, you, again, the name that you use might not be the name that I use or somebody else use, so it's hard to, to judge. I did, did the poll, though. Oh, it's a good one. <laughs> but, and uh, for how long, you know, how long it takes, you said it's a, it's a template or a format that could be modifiable. So why just do, you know, what's already there, send it to, to the people, let you know. Say, we have, you know, two months, three months, I mean, six months to decide. Then keep, you know, reminding them every month, hey, haven't bought it, and then you do it. And then, you know, you could later add more if something new happens. Yeah, there, there will be uh, versions. There will be many iterations anyway, that, you know. So, but what, so what would it take, my question to you as a community is, what would it take for version 1.0 to have some amount of legitimacy? How many polls does it take? on that call uh, a convention that's advertised by the uh, pages inqua and those uh, organizations that are recognized as uh, communities and like a meeting uh, and people who be there will decide mm -hmm. pretty much i think uh, uh, well the bottom of uh, system is, is is nice but it also takes a lot of time so um, a meeting d d dedicated to that advertised by the organization I think could be a solution and because in the end we we all agree that we need okay standard names but we also all agree that Delta 18O or, Del or D 18O is not really a critical thing uh, so we kind of need to move past that so so that's a proposition what's uh, I had another comment 
going back to what's the information we would like to put in, in there. Uh, that's bit, maybe a bit more tricky. Um, my personal opinion would to stick to what's really objective and not interpret it. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, things evolve. Now the depth where you collected your sample, that won't change. The radiocarbon dates, it won't change. Now calibration change, or uh, interpretation like, I don't know, proxies interpreted as temperature. Mm -hmm. Well, a few years later, s some will say, well, it's not just temperature, it's also whatever. So I think we've got to stick to what's really objective and stable in, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, information. So I'll, I'm sure Daryl has something to say about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, right, well, so with, with respect, I, I guess I, I do have a different uh, perspective on the importance of including interpretive information. Absolutely, the, the bottom line, what's most important are the objective data that survive forever. But I think we all know that in, um, our insights into data sets do evolve with time. And I think it's very helpful for the community for that information from the experts to travel along with the data so that those who are going to use the data in the future can take the, you know, have the benefit of having that additional insight from the experts that, you know, this particular record has now been um, determined to have these particular flaws or it's been updated according to this new site. Otherwise, there's sort of um, a gap in our knowledge that, that uh, uh, future uh, data users might say, well, you know, why did this data set get dropped? And, uh, um, you know, who is the one who is familiar with the data who can alert the community that there are some issues with this particular data set? So, so I think one of the beauties of, of having a platform like a, a wiki to, 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 uh, to store the data, and of course this is linked with, link, uh, with, uh, with the Lipid, is to, um, to, to have those interpretive remarks uh, as, as, as yet another field that travels with the data set. Um, right, so. Yeah. Good comments. Like, then you'd require, like, uh, with the size of group, with the spillover database, we, we are in the preliminary stages. We preliminary decided not to field interpretation, mm -hmm. just the objective data. Like this is, will be discussed in our first meeting in June, so it's not a final decision yet. But one of the issues that were, was raised um, in favor of not including the interpretation was if it's going to change in the future, and we need, we'll need someone, we'll require that person to go to the database and update it, and update that interpretation. So it won't be a standalone database that can be reused. It will need very frequent, frequent updates on in terms of the interpretation so that users are using the latest interpretation of that, of those records. So and what happens no? if we will have different interpretation of the data Are we going to find the wiki? Yeah, we probably will find it. Yeah, so uh, this gets back to a question that was asked that I think was really important uh, after Julian's talk at the plenary, plenary on uh, Wednesday, and that is, you know, how, how does the community know which are those records that carry more of the information versus those that are going to pollute our data set? So how do we separate the, well, I think the word was the iconic records from, from those that are less useful? And uh, I think that's a really important question, and I think it's, it's why a lot of people are shying away from the data compilations because they feel like there's, it, 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 we're, we're mixing everything together and we're, that's a disservice to, to the science. And so I do think that it, it's key. I mean, if, if we were to submit a paper with a data set and as, a, as an editor, we would see um, the reviewer's comments about the quality of the data set. And why shouldn't that be open to the entire community to understand where there may be concerns, no, no, no. where the, it, yes, it's more work and, no, and yeah, there would be, no? No. have to be revisions. Only but I, so I think pretty strongly that is part yes, of okay. how we track our knowledge as a community and, and giving people an opportunity to to vet concerns about a data set and have that recorded in a transparent way. I really did that. We can move the, oh, okay. the mic on the other side of the 
room that would be very good. I would just like to comment on this. I suppose this is a philosophical question of how much the users are emancipated in their ability to, to interpret the raw data themselves objectively rather than having to rely or, or maybe argue with previous interpretations that are recorded in the data sets. In other words, if only raw data are being recorded, you only need to explain that I interpret all speleotems north of this as in precipitation and south of this, that, etc. If not, point? you will have to argue with every single record why you changed the interpretation as it was originally recorded. So that's a philosophical question. Now we move on to the second half. Okay. Uh, just very quickly, I would like to respond to, to Julien's uh, question about how many people need to, to respond to a poll so that it's really uh, worth something. I would argue to, to, to do an iteration in between. I would probably say, let's do a first round in a few months, weeks, whatever we think is, uh, is helpful. Then prepare something like a white paper that is sent out to EOS, for example very big visibility saying this is the status now. That's what Pages has, or the community has come up. It's not done yet. Now you see it, you can comment, you can shoot at it, you can uh, make it better. But uh, So we don't have to end with um, a poll with three people or so and with no visibility. I think it's very important that there is a first round with suggestions that is very well distributed People can then either react to it or not, but they can't say, oh, we didn't know about that, we don't, we don't like it, because it was so visible that everybody had to see it. Okay, I like that. So to, to bring a little bit of peace to the valley as to interpretation or not interpretation, there is an official mechanism in the ontology um, for that, and we distinguish between variables that are observed and things that are inferred. And you know, from the very beginning, Nick and I had, you know, this recognize the distinction, uh, the need to make that distinction. And so, you know, I think that once things are labeled, then people can do whatever they want. And that's also the point. You know, in just like, oh, people won't use the database if it has this or that. Well, if the database is intelligent, you can query for whatever you want. So you can say, I only want magnesium calcium, or I want things that are interpreted as temperature. So I either trust what people, are, what the interpretations, or I decide to make my own. Uh, but once again, that's the beauty of having a system where things are labeled in, in other words, you usually can't have that with just an Excel spreadsheet. But once you have, and you know, that's why we had to go through this additional complexity. And so it's a bit more of a hurdle, and I recognize it for the first time, people who just come to it, like why did they have to make it so complicated? And it's precisely for that kind of reason. So then you have more flexibility in the information you put, and then people can decide to use whatever they want. There was, oh yeah, Christine. So I think this discussion's been great, but I kind of wanted to throw out a community top-down approach, and that would be um, whenever you're reviewing papers or if you're an editor of a journal, to start requiring authors to have information on their physical samples, how they're archiving their data. Are they looking towards those communities starting to build up standards? And same for reviewing proposals. So in the US now, we have data management plans. And I've participated on review panels, and that's starting to come up more and more. And the program managers are looking to the community, the people who are in the panel, to say, this is acceptable, this is not. And I think as we start to coalesce and start to build these efforts, spread the word, and more people are getting comments on their papers. I think we were at Ocean Sciences um, and it was a physical sample workshop, and there was people in the room who were there because a reviewer or an editor told them they would not publish their paper till they put in documentation of where their physical samples are from, how they got their export permits and everything. So that's motivating people to start to become more aware of how to store and put their metadata out there. So we can have this community top-down approach as well, and I think that will help move things along. I mean, in, in many ways, it's still bottom-up, as I see it, in terms of the, uh, the journals are looking to the community. Because, you know, we have this discussion with journal editors, and they told us, I don't know right. what, I, I, will do, I would do top-down if I knew what to tell the community, right. uh, or to tell the, 
the author. So they need a set of best practices and recommendations. And you know, if we operate in a vacuum, I think Pages is as well positioned as any organization to start proposing something. And the journals will go along with that. And then if people, once again, if people have issue with this, uh, they will perhaps uh, participate in the discussion. Another comment? Because uh, I want to keep a couple of minutes to give you a brief tour, but we have 20 minutes or so. so. Um, actually, she's, she's just gone, but I, I wanted to ask whether there's already willingness here for some of the more specialized standards on, on archiving and things to agree already that they would work with the linked earth as a feeder channel for this kind of data. I mean, this is the only way I think it will work without getting a massive proliferation of different things is you kind of have to allow for the specialized fields to have their own thing and but then that's fine when it works as a, as a feeding channel for the bigger more general project like linked earth is it seems the most general at the moment although i i also why it's i mean it doesn't even have to be paleo data it's the lipid format i mean could work really well for most environmental data. But I, I realize why it starts this. It's specifically called paleo data. But as, as long as the age model could accommodate current new data, where the, mm -hmm. the age model is the, top, the clock. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you could put other things in yeah. lipid. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Like We would never archive I mean, model output in lipid. Yeah, model example. output, maybe not. I, was I mean, not, not G GCMs. So yeah, there's yeah. limitations to that. But we have to start somewhere, right? The, the yeah, other, yeah, yeah, that's the other conversation I've had is modelers said, well, why don't you just put your paleo data in NetCDF? Uh, yeah. Which is, <laughs> obviously, they don't know a whole lot about I, paleo data. I, uh, but so as, as, uh, as we talk about feeder channels, we also wanted to recognize, and this is a very partial list here, uh, that there have been many community workshops before <coughs> where some of these data stewardship discussions have come up, right? So we're not operating in a vacuum. So in particular, we started by looking at this report from this workshop uh, in Trieste in Italy. I don't know any of you who were there, but you know, Helen McGregor was talking about it the other day and says, you know, not nearly enough people know about this thing. And there were a lot of really interesting reports written by specialists of the various archives. And few people know about it. It's linked here. There's also, uh, there was also a PMU3 workshop in Corvallis where I think Michal was. And in fact, Deborah, who's the postdoc on the project, actually was the one who took notes at that meeting. And she said, yeah, Michal actually put me in, in, in charge of taking the notes. So I have the report from that meeting and we, we never published it. So it's there. And the more you have such reports lying around from previous discussions, you know, we want them documented here so we can point to this is where a lot of these original ideas came from, right? So that's one part. Um, then we had a workshop on paleoclimate data standards at NOAA last year. Many of you were there, uh, some of you at least. Um, but it was very um, NOAA, I mean, it was very US-centric. Um, and one of the things that came up is the, as we devise standards is the necessity to, uh, to separate between modern data sets and legacy data sets. And where you put the boundary is, again, something that needs to be agreed upon. But it goes without saying that the bar needs to be a lot higher now. Uh, if you can ask people who are still alive what's in their data, it's a lot easier than to have to deal with uh, you know, uh, old notebooks of people who are no longer in this world. So that's one part that, uh, so that, you know, there, was, there was this thing. And there was this uh, idea of cross-archive standards that we, you know, we, we said, um, or at least that's what came up at that workshop, that, uh, that we needed these four things to, to call a, um, that these four things were essential. 
and then everything else would, could be either recommended or desired. So part of the, the way we structure the discussion is that by default, any metadata is desired. We will never refuse any metadata. So everything is useful, potentially. But what is essential and what is recommended? So we decided that only these four things were truly essential. That you need a table with at least two things, uh, one of them being time and one of them being some climate or paleo or environmental indicator of some kind. And it's not, it could be ecology, it could be anything. The other one would be some information about the location, so latitude, longitude, and usually uh, elevation. Um, the source, so where did it come from? Uh, perhaps even, you know, not necessarily the funding, but at least where, who was the person behind this or the, the entity? And then the names and the units of the variables. So, but again, that is something that only a subset of the community had input on. And so there, is, there are a number of working groups that we created. Um, and so there is a cross archive metadata working group. And if uh, you want to go on the wiki, you can, um, you can start uh, expressing yourself on this thing. So this is one such poll. I think it started in March. Um, you know, so this is to decide, you know, what is, um, what data sets we should accept. You know, so only things that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, things that are both in peer-reviewed or non-peer-reviewed publications, like, you know, so-called gray literature, like dissertations, you know, appendices and things like that, or anything that's published or not. Um, so, you know, do we take anything or do we only take peer-reviewed things? Anyway, so you can vote here. Um, so again, you need to be logged on to be able to vote. Another way, uh, however, to vote is that uh, Deborah and the linked earth the Twitter account periodically repost these polls. And so that's one way. It, there's obviously much less traceability with Twitter polls, and there's also a possibility for double dipping, that people can vote both on the wiki and on Twitter. But uh, we found that we've had much more luck uh, getting people to vote on Twitter because you know, there isn't that barrier of having to log in and all of that. So uh, that's another way to, to get feedback. Um, so, you know, this is one example of a longitudinal working group where, you know, it doesn't matter whether you live in caves or you live in mud. Um, but we have a, a whole set of other working groups that are very um, archive centric. So we have one for MARPA and a lot of the initial discussion for this started from the MARPA template. Um, and so one of the things that um, that was done. This, or Deborah sort of helped put this as a table, but not, most of this has not been really um, transferred into a poll yet, but we have other examples, and I want to show you one, because in the best cases, marine sediments is what um, Deborah knows most about, so whenever the page loads, I'll be able to show you that. Um, we're able to actually vote on properties, or we, we're linking to terms that are defined in our ontology. And the value of that is that it sort of takes you to that page where, you know, what do we mean by sensor? What do we mean by observation? What do we mean by archive? All these things are formally defined in the ontology. And it's sometimes helpful to look at definitions so that you know what you're voting on. Um, because as it turns out, we all have slightly different ideas about these things. So, you know, we, we have things about sample identifiers, so you know whether it should be IGSN or not. But let me try and look for that. So we have a bunch of polls here, a lot of polls, and here was one example, for example, uh, on instrumentation and uh, you know whether there's a set of questions here about how much detail should be necessary to describe the instrumentation on how something was measured. Uh, but here you, we have a link to uh, the category in the ontology called instrument. Okay, so we have a very general definition, a tool used to produce measured variables. Okay, so that's our definition. If you don't like it, you can actually click discussion and you can say, I really don't like this thing. And then you can sign with this and, uh, well, I'm going to, preview it, and I'm not going to save it because that would look a little messy, but it'll, you know, there's a timestamp, and it's one way for you guys as a community to have a discussion and to, for that discussion to be very transparent. 
Um, so what else should I show? Any suggestions? <laughs> Sorry, it's completely unrelated question, but uh, it's something that has come up to my attention. Uh, it's the licensing problem because now you uh, you are making it easy to put uh, to put a lot of data online and make it making it easy for people to use it. But um, are you putting some licensing information on the data or, or not? Like for instance, uh, in the case of uh, um, in the case of the CMIP6 database, they will be using uh, the Creative Commons license. Uh, I think by uh, I think the proper terms are uh, it's data attribution, share, share alike, like, and yeah. uh, and people can add non-commercial if they if they want. So, are you doing such a thing, or is it already? Do you have a field in this in Lipid, for instance? For registering licensing, I think this is a matter for the for the for the archives because neither Lipid nor NetCDF or any other format is actually physically storing the the data, right? So this is on Pangaea or no, or Noah, and they have got some license with with which you can uh, you can use the data any further. And if it is about uh, using the the date the, the software the, or, or the sort of software tools that you use to extract information from the data, then it would be, I think, the software license that you can then atta attach to it. Because usually, I guess it's probably the data producer that chooses, or maybe the project. Uh, that's I, it's it's actually a really good point, and we hadn't thought about it, but again, it's one of the beautiful things about the system is you can create new properties. And mm -hmm. so right now, I could create something called license or you know terms of use or something like that, and, uh, and people can start linking to that. Uh, but you're right, I think it should be at the discretion of the authors uh, how they want their data to be reused. And we should encourage you know, that being an option. Okay, I think the time has approached a level where we uh, can uh, retire to lunch. I would like to thank everybody a lot for this discussion. We have been taking notes. And uh, we will continue this discussion at the, the SSC of, of pages and uh, see how we can take it further to uh, do service to community and uh, hopefully at the near future come up with a system where it will be easy for everybody to input new data and where it will be possible to process legacy data in a way that we can happily mine and analyze in the future uh, for a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.